So 12th century onwards, we can tell you some of the important events that happen here. Now, you might come up to me afterwards and you say, hey, Charlie, you know, you look at this vast vista, you've got all the way around here. There must have been something on this hill even before the early 12th century. And I'd agree with that. There must have been something here. But what? It's what I tend to call a lot of the maybe, possibly stuff. And I tend not to do this on the tour so much. If I start telling you what might have been here, we would be here a long time. But I will do this one very quickly. So I think you'll agree that it has to be a certainty, this one. 79, 80 AD is when the Romans came up through Scotland. And the Romans getting as far north as near Aberdeen. Now, you start looking at this, surely the Romans must have had a signalling station on here there might have been some more important the reason there's a question mark on it is what was found one Roman coin is always recorded as being found on this hill what happens later when this is built because this is more or less it's not that far down you hit the volcanic rock so this makes it very difficult to get underneath to get that earlier evidence I think you'd agree with me it must have been the case we know Oh, uh, even before the Romans, 3,000 years ago, there's evidence of Bronze Age people living on the hills just across there, and you would have thought the same. Surely if they were living just across there, they would have used this as well. Anyway, uh, as I say, 12th century onwards, I think, is probably enough to cope with, isn't it, in 50 minutes? <laughs> have you, can you put your hand up if you have been here before? Has anybody been here before? This is safely, you can say, that this was the most important castle. There's three things for me on this. One, castles are about defence. That's why they build them, of course. There is a history here of wars, battles fought. There are at least six battlefields just below you. When I say at least, you know, you talk about what was described exactly as a battle of skirmishes and so on. But there are at least six battlefields just below you. Civil War, Scots fighting Scots, the wars between England and Scotland, wars of independence fought just here below these walls. Cromwell soldiers, as we know, got everywhere. Um, and then the later Jacobite risings. There's so much history with the, the battles that happened on this. That's one of the three. The second is the Royals. Now, if you if you've been to Edinburgh Castle or you're going, you'll you'll find out, of course, that the Royals were there and well, you can see those two bits of the hills just across there as were Falkland palaces and halfway between here and there you've got Linlithgow palace and the royals moved about spent so much of the year at each place when they came here these buildings as we'll see they are quite special well say this now, this royal palace is regarded as Scotland's, as Britain's finest Renaissance building here at this castle. So we've got the battles, we've got the royals. It's number three. You can't get this anywhere else. And what makes this castle so very important? Well, it isn't here. It isn't in the castle. It's just outside it. And the walls at that side, if you look below, you see a bridge, a Stirling Bridge. Now, you think about it, a bridge of course improves the movement of people and goods. That bridge did a lot more because there you've got one half of Scotland below us. Well, I shouldn't perhaps say this, I said it on the earlier tour, I don't know if it is going to be now or not, but if that did just haze lift or whatever, you'd see the mountains and the highlands over there. You've got one half of Scotland there, the other half of Scotland there. And in those days, the only way you could get between the two was a bridge. Now, any invading army was going through Scotland. They had to come just here. So, of course, you held this. You held that bridge and you secured the most strategic point in Scotland. It was said that you held Stirling, basically held Scotland. If you haven't already seen the bridge, if you go to the walls, as I say, that side, look below it. The one you see down there is 14, possibly early 1500s. It's regarded as the finest bridge like it in Scotland. In 12, 
97, one of these important battles that I mentioned did take place at the bridge. 1297 was called the Battle of Stirling Bridge. A great <laughs> Scottish hero. Anyone wants to suggest who this could be? Great Scottish hero? Bruce. Oh, can, no, he comes in in a minute. You were saying Wallace. <laughs> William Wallace uh, has a famous victory against the forces of Edward I, Battle of Stirling Bridge. The reason you're seeing the Storm Tower, by the way, is the National Wallace Monument, telling us where Wallace himself, he stood there all those years ago. Many years later, uh, Mel Gibson did stand there as well, if you do remember that. Um, I had to stop saying that, but he always gets a smile. Mel, uh, yeah, and the, the European premiere for the film, by the way, was at the Arts Centre just below it. Uh, the other great victory the Scots uh, having against the English, uh, you mentioned, Robert the Bruce there, that's there, the Battle of Bannockburn, just where the buildings are finished there, 1314, uh, that, that battle, and that was against the forces of Edward II of England. Now for you, coming to look round this castle, people come up to me and say, oh, the castle of Wallace and Bruce, well, Wallace and Bruce didn't see any of this, because the first thing Bruce did after his victory, 1314, Robert the Bruce ordered the taking down of Stirling Castle. He said, get rid of it. The reason they do give us it really was to stop the English getting back on the hill and holding it against the Scots again. Uh, I say again, underneath here where we stood is an exhibition. Have a look at that later. I think it will cover even more things that I'm going to tell you. And one of the panels in that will tell you the times the English held it, the Scots, the English, the Scots, the English. Eight times it changed during the Wars of Independence. So the oldest part of this that I can show you as we go through it is from around 1381. That is the oldest structure that we'll see. Welcome to you folks joining Thank us, by you. the Sorry, way. You missed late. No, don't you apologise. Uh, my name's Charlie. It'll be about 40, 50 minutes. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, so, as, as I said, the oldest bit we'll, we'll see is 1381. So we'll, we'll start looking at what we've come to look at. We'll start with the gateway that's right in front of us here. If you were arriving here, can I ask you just to, if I come to that side here, because I hate sort of, it looks as well, I'm sort of pointing at you. Uh, if you're arriving here, ooh, around 500 years ago, in the early 1500s, this would have been the main entrance to the castle not the one you came in behind you. All this that was stood on and behind you is about 300 years old, so forget this bit for now. 500 years ago, you'd be coming towards that. You'd be on a horse, click, clop, click, clop. Oh. And if you were arriving to see the king, because that's who would be here, King James IV, he does quite a lot of building here. The same king that builds this, builds that behind him. Great hall, the cream, the gold coloured. Now I'll tell you more about that colour when I take you inside there. I don't know if you can do this sort of thing or not, but if you can, well and good. Put the colour you see there, all on here, because that's how this thing has come off over the centuries. But something else has happened to this apart from the colour coming off it. Look at the stone at the top, you see it's a wee bit different up there. And that's from the 1800s to tidy up a bit. In the 1500s, you coming towards that, those towers, twice the height that you see, and twice as many. Two towers, look there. Looks like a big plant pot now with some heathers planted on it. You see where the wall changes. There's evidence of the other side where the other towers stood, so very different. What's happened? Two things really, as I say, attacked so many times and later some defence changes made to it as well. If you want to date on this one, I suppose a good one would be 1651. I won't be mentioning a lot of years and dates to you as I go around with you, but the 1600s were not very interesting times of course. The last king that would live in here. Not gone out for the day, of course. The king here, James VI, goes to London, becomes known by many as James I, the Union of the Crowns. He goes and calls it Great Britain. He goes and designs the flag you see above the gate that he left, Union Jack, Union James. Political and religious turmoil here, also in England as well. 
Now, when he died, James VI, James I, in 1625, it's always very easy for me to remember who was next, of course. Charles. You mentioned Charles Cromwell, you know, the parliamentarians mm -hmm. against the royalists. It's that church tower there, actually, where Cromwell's soldiers put the cannon on top of that tower pointed it at this and gave the order, it was a general monk here in Scotland for Cromwell, gave the order to fire, FIRE! BOOM! FIRE! BOOM! Well you get the idea, there's quite a bit of that. And that's when a lot of, look at the Great Hall today, it's got the marks, the bullet marks all up there uh, of that attack. They're the last actually by the way, Cromwell soldiers are the last to take the castle and nearly the last to get in without a ticket <laughs> uh, if you like i'm going on holiday next week and it's a bit i know this is a bit sad but i go to castles when i'm on holiday uh, and looking around and a lot of them are in ruins as we know because of cromwell evidence of this damage here when we look at the royal palace it's remarkable more damage was not done to that really. Uh, I said James IV builds a lot of the castle that we've seen, but I'll mention more about the palace because that's built by his son James V around 1540. It's, it's built just really when he's married his second French wife, Mary of Guise. And uh, it's really it is at this time thinking about this because all this isn't here. The cannons are getting better by now. This is starting to look very weak. just the same over there. They took the tower down, put three cannons on it. They build all this, 1710, 1714. Uh, ready in time for the last time this. This is the last castle that's attacked on British mainland. On his way back from Derby, another Charlie of course, Bonnie Prince Charlie. Now just through here, I'll show you some of the damage you can see from that last attack here. And we better get ourselves inside some of these places as well. He's uh, on his way back from Derby. That's about 100 miles from London. He really was advised he wasn't going to get a crown for his father, first of all, ultimately himself. So the Jacobites came back here to Scotland. You get a chance to go down into the town of Stirling, some of the town walls still remain. They say they fired about 30 shots into the town. Boom! Boom, 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 boom! Boom, 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 boom! I'm not going to do the full 30, <laughs> yes, but at least on camera. The town council had a meeting, decided pretty quickly to surrender. So the town gates were flung open, Bonnie Prince Charlie marches into town, then decides to get the castle. Now, we're talking about the importance of Stirling Bridge, just where these people are here, that's a great place to view the bridge. Right at the side of Stirling Bridge is the Gowan Hill. That's where Bonnie Prince Charlie put his cannons, January 1746. actually but we're going to try and recreate the sound of that attack so this is your chance to give me a quick loud boom <laughs> a bit louder than that one. i'll stand back a bit it gets a bit scary <laughs> see what you can do after three one two three boom wow <laughs> you've been practicing on the bus on the <laughs> don't do that to the coach driver if you want to coach uh, I, I, I cannot ask you to do better than that. We always do two, so we will do one more. Just I'll say this, when you look at Stirling Bridge, you might see the trains go by. And that's how I go home tonight. I'll get on the platform and they sometimes come up to me and say, hey, you know, it must be really afternoon. Do one, two, three! Boom! <laughs> <laughs>
This is the only side of the palace you will see as such damage. Look up at the top again, covered with the bullet marks. There's certainly weathering going on with the statues as well, but as I say, evidence of that attack. But no, Bonnie Prince Charlie does not manage to get in here. Uh, I don't. I only do two of these what ifs, by the way. Two. This is the first one. What if he had got in here? Because we always talk about the possibility that had he got the castle, he might have just had a chance you know, to rebuild an army here no. in Scotland. He doesn't get the castle, so of course he goes north and Culloden, just outside Inverness, last battle for British soil because he didn't get in here. Should have bought a ticket. I've never done that bad job. <laughs> uh, I told you they took the tower down there. I told you they built all that. But I better really show you what secures the victory here. And as the as they say in pantomime land, it's behind you, this here. So I'll just come to this side of you. And uh, this area here is where the kitchens that extended up the way. They reduced those kitchens to create this grand battery facing that Gowan Hill. So it's this that secures the victory for the British Army on that time. Uh, underneath all this, all oh, the surviving medieval kitchens. Do not miss visiting these. The entrance is just down, oh, someone's just appearing there. It, it's just down this way and that'll take you all that. So do go and explore that. As we're so near it, I am going to show you that oldest part of the castle from 1381. 1381, that's the time of the first Stuart monarch, Robert II. He was the grandson of King Robert the Bruce. Uh, later, as you're going around the castle, you'll probably come across this board showing you the Stuart lineage from Robert II. Well, when you see all those royals, they would have come in and out of here. There would have been a doorway at the far end as well, but not as the design that you saw it. But this was used as a way in and out. The posterns that were off at the far end, the doorways as well, were closed off again during that Jacobite rising to improve the defence. Think about this, I suppose it makes it good for me visiting now. It means you can't really get lost here. There's only one way in and out now where you're coming up there. These buildings down here, it's where the kennels were for the hunting dogs. They were later converted into gunpowder storage places. Now, today, as you see, we get a lot of school visits. So, one of these we do use as a schoolroom, and one we use as an exhibition space. Historic Scotland, we actually look after over 300 monuments throughout Scotland and the environment and green issues is on everybody's agenda today. We've got an exhibition about that down here. There's one at the end, you can go inside, see how the gunpowder was stored. Now, when you look at those barrels, there's no gunpowder in there today. If you've gone in there with your shoes on, shh, wee bit of a spark, boom! <laughs> <laughs> that is the last one. <laughs> uh, I, actually, it was a time when I used to do another 26. <laughs> I better not tell you about that one. There was a 26 gun thing going on in the hall at one time. It was exhausting. <laughs> The very end of here is the Tapestry Studio. Part of the major works of restoring the Royal Palace uh, was to recreate a set of medieval tapestries. Tapestries that have been made, you'll see in the Queen's Room. The last piece of the seven is being woven now, as I speak. And down there, you can see this remarkable work taking place. There's just a few months left of that one down there. Uh, I, oh, it's, no, I better mention it at this time. We, the castle, we close at six o'clock. The tapestry studio closes at five. There's only one other place that closes earlier, and I'll mention it when we look at it. Uh, as we're coming back here, oh, thinking of all those royals that are coming in and out of here. A few years I've been here, the castle's been used for filming 
on a number of occasions. But one film that was made before I came up here, Walt Disney's version of Kidnapped. Uh, you are now walking in the footsteps of Michael Caine. And uh, not a lot of people know that. But, uh, <laughs> bad joke for that one. So. <laughs> this way. Having just showed you the oldest structure, the North Gate, 1381, as a building facing us here, commanding the highest point of the Castle Rock, and we call it the King's Old Buildings, it's 15th century. I said James IV built a lot of the castle that we see, the king who built the Great Hall here. Well, he had a good view of that because that's where he lived. And again, if you can do that sort of thing, the colour you see there, all on here. Yeah. The building has seen quite a few changes to it. Now, I know this next bit I'm going to ask you to do is a bit difficult, this. Just for a moment or two, I want you to think that I am the king. <laughs> <laughs> and James IV, and I'll try and do this a bit quicker, actually. I'm going towards my house. Look where I'm going. I'm going towards the door. I'm going to the door. Oh. a fire in the 1850s that did that and it had to be rebuilt. Well, this building does actually explain why for many years we could not go into all parts of the castle that I'm just going to take you into now, even the time that I've been up here. Uh, I was talking about the British Army being about at the Jacobite Risings. By the end of the 1700s, the British army is getting bigger, preparing for wars with Napoleon, the French, the Scottish regiments, of course, part of it. This castle, late 1700s, full of it, is full of soldiers. The regiment that was based here, the Argyle of the Sutherland Highlanders, reserved at the Battle of Waterloo. Um, if I, there's, there's 200 years of history in there, and that is their museum. It's regiment's own museum. So again, really well worth seeing. Uh, I, one thing people come up to me every week and they'll say something like this to me. They say they remember being here 15 years or so, and they remember this amazing silverware. That's one thing alone we'll see. So not everyone's into the soldier military stuff, so even if you're not, just have a look at the silverware, beautiful. Uh, I better mention this, this is that other part of the castle that closes early. Tapestry Studio 5, this is 5, but I think they close the doors at quarter to 5, and then everyone out for 5, so uh, have a look at that. Uh, now, the other thing of course, apart from the door and the storm there, the windows. And James IV, if he built the Great Hall, there would have been apparently that size of windows in these areas, some people can work it out with the storm there in one or two places. Uh, but the soldiers come in and put windows like that into there. Now if you look at the Great Hall and think of the windows there being sash case wooden windows, I'll just come through there. Is it 19... Oops, no, that's okay. 1964, the soldiers left. Historic Scotland could start restoring this castle. This is where the work really started. They lifted out the window frames and all this colour was found behind the wood. And apparently they also found accounts of it in maintenance in the 16th century as well. And what is it? Oh, well, uh, I, 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 well I'm gonna ask you a question. What have they, what have they used to make this castle? Stone. Built it with stone, glass will mention, wood, mm. type of stone. Sandstone? Yeah, a lot of it. Mm. And if you look in the chapel windows there, you can see what can happen to soft sandstone. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. This 
covering is actually a medieval technique <coughs> to protect such buildings. Scotland, they call it harling. The secret is the lime in the mortar. You go and ask them about it, what they come out with is this phrase that it lets the stone breathe. What that really means is it doesn't trap any moisture. Mm. Occasionally, it can rain. <laughs> and when it does rain, this changes in front of you within just an hour or two of the rain hitting it. The best I can show you is that potchy bit. Mm. Yeah. That's, a bit yeah. the, that's a bit where the moisture's still there, but mm. the whole side will go darker colour within just a few hours. Mm. Mm. That's a gold wedding ring. And that colour is written down in the accounts as King's Gold. Mm. Of course, mm. gold wealth. Mm. And this scale? Mm. Power. Mm. All this gold. Um, I don't usually mention this on the tour. I usually tell you just to go and look at the film on the top floor of the palace. And uh, uh, there's a film that shows you all this. And as it finishes, every statue of which is over 250 carvings all around there would all be different colours, bright colours. Mm. And behind, again, all this gold. Mm. Very bright. Uh, I said the royals did special buildings here and the Great Hall is certainly one of them because in 1503 James IV has built the largest medieval hall that's ever built in Scotland. This is one room so we better go and have a look at it. Mary Queen of Scots, James VI, they all use this, you'd have royal court, parliaments were held here. You see the kitchens, don't miss those, you'll see all the food for the banquets. I mean my goodness me did they they, they certainly knew how to party in this building. We still talk about them. <laughs> and this one I will mention. There's two I could do, but we'll do this one for you. Uh, James VI, he's baptised at the castle in 1566. His mother, Mary Queen of Scots, she's gone and invited ambassadors from all around the world to come and celebrate in here. She wanted to do something special. Well, we know she went to Edinburgh to borrow some money. £12,000 is what she borrowed. In today's money, that is something like nearly two and a half million. Um, I think you'd agree you could put on not a bad party for two and a half million. Um, one, two, three, four, five huge fireplaces. Those fires were kept fully burned. They weren't allowed to go out while the party lasted. They were kept going for three days and three nights. That's how long the party lasted. Imagine the feasting, the drinking, the dancing. And just imagine the dancing on the third night. That must have been uh, something else. It is the first uh, firework display ever in Scotland, 1566. Behind you, the Minstrels Gallery. This is where the musicians in those days would entertain. It has still got a music connection today. You unlock the castle, the CD player is in the far corner. <laughs> <laughs> um, over here, you've got the Trumpeter's Loft, where the trumpeteers would herald the arrival of the royals. Do, 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 do. Not as good with trumpets, but anyway. If you, you, you were coming to such a party, this is the way that you'd come in. It was the first time they built a bridge that links it to the royal apartments. The bridge there is a replacement one now. The royals would come. Oh, if it isn't every week, it is certainly every month. They do have parties in here. Weddings, uh, corporate business events, award ceremonies, this sort of thing, you know. So if any of you do fancy having a wild party here, just do ask me. I'll put you in directions for inquiries. You can hire the place out. Uh, people do. It would change so, so much when the soldiers came to use it. And I know this always adds a couple of minutes to the tour, but I'll show you a clue to that. Let's Can you go. just tell me what's behind, what are behind these curtains? What would be here? Just wall. Just wall? Yeah. Not tapestries or portraits? Ah, no, no, sorry, what, what, sorry, your question was behind there. Yeah. You're asking, yes, okay. What you're seeing today 
is a, a design that's contemporary with the building. Right. It's a Victorian Albert Museum in London that keeps records of every design and the period that they're from. It's got the thistle on it, right. so it's appropriate. And it's from the same year as the building was built. Mm. Tapestry-wise, well, if you go into the Royal Palace, we do know there was a set. James V actually had over 100 tapestries and they can't find any of the tapestries that were here because of course the royals would take everything with them when they move about mm. and they did find a set that translated as the history of the life of the unicorn mm. so knowing that there were tapestries in the royal apartments with unicorns on there's only two surviving sets in the world uh, there's 12 sets of tapestry in the world I should say but there's two of those sets that have unicorns on. Paris have a set called The Lady and the Unicorn, and uh, in the Cloisters in New York is where they've got a set called The Hunt of the Unicorn. They chose The Hunt of the Unicorn to reproduce, so even though those tapestries were not here at the castle, they're the closest they've been able to do for the Royal Apartments. When you go to the studio, you'll find that those tapestries, 13 years work, two million pounds, to do what maybe would fill three quarters of this wall. So yeah. We do know there was a set apparently called Hercules. I think is he 12 tasked Hercules. If we were to cover these walls with handmade tapestries, oh, 13 years, 30. You'd be looking at 30 some years, and I don't know how many millions. Mm. Because that's what they costed those tapestries in 2000, over 13 years' work. You'd be looking at 30 years' work, and I don't know how many millions. Yeah, thank you. But hey, if you've got it and you're interested, you know. <laughs> uh, let me take you Make out that two stones have been replaced. It's one of the floor levels that will go throughout the building. And then just where the timbers start, another floor level going all the way through. So three separate floors were put in by the military. The original hammer being moved, it was taken away for dormer type windows, the type you still see in the military museum. So you have 250 soldiers at least sleeping in here. And when they left, as I say, this is where the work really started restoration wise. This building took 35 years over eight million pounds to restore just this part of the castle. The magnificent hammer beam roof that we're looking at, this was put in in 1997. Uh, 350, 100 year old Scottish York from Strathair, 40 miles from here is where the timber came from. And it's all held together with wooden pegs. There's no screws, there's no nails, no glue. People often remark that it's very similar structure to that of a ship. The very same time James IV built the Great Hall. Ties 1566, we were saying, is the date above the door. 1594. Not baptised in here. You might remember at the beginning I talked about a 12th century chapel for King Alexander I. There's one or two stones of that remain of the building that's going up in the corner. Now, you might be thinking military changes. No, no. The royal changes made here centuries ago. And we know that because of where we are stood. Just here, you can see the coddles marking out the area. This was one area that archaeologists could get part down and evidence of this chapel. This would be where James VI was baptised, his mother, the most famous queen mentioned here in Scotland, Mary Queen of Scots, aged nine months old, crowned here. Who knows, maybe just where you stood, maybe it might be that far actually. And uh, we just mentioned Flodden in there, James IV dying on the field of Flodden, we of course get James V crowned here. There's a lot of history under here. Now the reason this is we do know why this isn't here. There's uh, accounts in Edinburgh telling us of the very poor state of, of repair that this was in. It did need a lot of work doing to it. But hey, if you've got the money to build that, why not repair this? We talk about this at time to time. Well, you look at the shape of everything going like this. Look at the entrance to the hall there. Surely this structure is partly in the way of that. 
So maybe that's another reason why this is built. We do know this actually. This had to be ready. It had to be ready in time for a very special occasion and it took six months to do that. Mm -hmm. Maybe a week, just over, just over a week over six months. So, you know, you've had kitchen extensions to know anything. You can't help but appreciate that one. Let's go and have a look inside. And it had to be ready for the baptism for the king's son, Frederick Henry. We call him Prince Henry. He was born here, the castle in the palace across there. Now, Prince Henry, of course, had he lived, he would have been Henry the Ninth. Aged 18, he was in London, and he did have this rather, well, I think you can safely call it, a rather strange, strict daily routine of activity. Two hours in the morning, he would practice with a pipe. And then at some time he'd be learning languages, riding horses, doing what princes do, I suppose, apart from the afternoon. Two hours, whatever the way, he plunged himself into the river. Not good. He drank a bit of water, caught the typhoid, and never made it. Now, you might remember, I said I only do two what if. This is the other one. What if we had made it? I think we'll all agree on this one. We're almost certain it could not have been from when the Civil War started in England. He would have handled things so, so differently. Uh, Born in the palace over there. Uh, anyway, try and cheer you up a wee bit. Had, uh, had that been the case, of course, we might still have those four big round towers and we'd all have a lot more castles to go and look at with roofs on. <laughs> to be, of course. Uh, the painting, I better mention this because this is a bit different. This is painted a bit later, 1628. It's an English artist based in Glasgow called Valentine Jenkins. Why? They painted that. Remember the royals are down, down in England. Surely they haven't painted that for soldiers that may be about. No. Somebody is coming to visit. James, his other son, Charles I. Now, when you're here at the castle, if you look over the walls over there, in the field below the castle, uh, uh, quite an area of these raised shapes. Charles I sent over 500 pounds just for gardens to be made for his visit. And this is done for Charles. The story is here that apparently Charles was going to use this castle as a base in Scotland. Very much like the Queen today comes to Hollywood and Balmoral for so much of the year. Charles I had this in mind. He came, he looked at the gardens, he looked at this. It doesn't come off, does it? Shoot! His head came up instead. But this is reminder of all this because what you're seeing there, the honours, Crown Jewels of Scotland, you visit Edinburgh Castle, of course, that's where you'll see Scotland's Crown Jewels. You've got the letter R for Rex, Latin for King, then you flip to the other side, you've got like a C and a 1 for Charles. Now I'm just going to finish the tour across in one room in the palace. I don't take you all the way around because people in costumes are doing little pieces. When we go across there, you're going to see a lot of this all over. A lot of eyes and fives. I is Jacobus, Latin for James. It's where this word Jacobites come from. Jacobus, Jacobus, supporters of the changes. Could this be a nine and a six? But I just told you it's a C and a one for Charles. I see you've got a guy, but yours is out there. Can I just what, what I'm doing here, by the way, it's one of the things I've got to tell you as I go around. I'm not only telling you, I'm showing you a brand new guidebook, Val. It's two years old now. And uh, when you look at this later, you'll see that this, we say Charles I. That's what a historic Scotland says. There was a debate on it. If you push me on it, I'd probably agree with historic Scotland. 
pay my wages, of course. My name is Charles. It suits me. But I probably would agree with it because of the timing. But I will say some people do have this other theory on it. One of the guides here, and I can perhaps agree with this, thinks that they look a bit different, and maybe the artist is perhaps doing both. I suppose it's worth mentioning this last thing about it, because nobody even has to think about it for 200 years, because you couldn't see it. In here, the military had put the ceiling. Now, somebody else could come to visit, Queen Victoria. It's just about that time, isn't it, that you get the railways. Once you get railways, you get people. The soldiers used to bring visitors round. And in the 1930s, there's enough people in here being told about this that they couldn't see. The pressure was on the work to start for visitors. In the 1930s, that's the very first thing to be done. That's a long time ago. So just two years ago, we finished the restoration of the Royal Palace. Now, as I say, I'll just take you to the first room and give you an introduction to just what you're going to see and why you're going to see it as you do, because it's a wee bit different in there. Uh, let's go and have a look at the Royal Palace. Around 1540, oh, so much tragedy to fill in in about three minutes here, so I hope you can keep up with this bit. Oh, this is tragic. Uh, he built this, as I say, around 1540. He just married his second French wife, Mary of Guise, from the French court. His first French wife was the daughter of the French king, Madeleine de Bois. Six months is what she lived in Scotland, and she died uh, of tuberculosis, they think. So he marries twice in about a year. And we were talking about dowries and these people getting money. Well, you can see he does pretty well. He gets about 170,000. Can you remember what we said 12,000 pounds was in there? 270,000. And uh, so, hey, he spent a lot of money. Now, me being from Yorkshire, that means something. He spent a lot of money. <laughs> And remember, I said this is where the kings lived. And James V would have been in there at times watching the French stonemasons carving out the statues. And this is what they tell me. The very moment this is ready for him to move into, guess what happens? No, he does. Uh, age 30, probably a waterborne disease, they tend to think. Uh, do you want me to try and cheer you up very quickly on this one? Mm. Oh, right, try and cheer. He is the first, you could say he's the first James to manage at least to die on the bed. Uh, James the first, he was murdered at Perth. James the second, he was really completely obsessed with following the technology of the development of the cannon too closely. He stood right by his own cannon as he as it blew up. Uh, James the Third. Now, James the Fourth, as a young boy, was very poorly, and James the Third had been favouring the other son. But James the Fourth did lead a rebellion against his father, just below the walls here at the Battle of Sockyburn. At the end of the battle, James the Third was done in. There. James the Fourth, we mentioned, died on the field of Flodden, so we could say at least James V just managed to die in the day. Anyway, the last thing, I suppose, is that you could say that he does, he does look at everybody that comes in and out of here, because his eyes are on you now. <laughs> and we know that's James V, because above the lion is holding a crown. If you go and look at it closely, you'll see that I-5 that I mentioned, Jacobus James V. You're just asking me about the statues. I, 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 I could go, but I better not. Up here, 
It's a five minute film and that will tell you all about the messages that are there and there's a free leaflet you can pick up. If you want me to come out in two or three minutes I will do more if you wish me to on that one. But also what should be mentioned up those steps as well as the five minute film about the statues, this castle is very well known for some remarkable carvings of wood known as the sterling heads or the sterling round rolls. In the ceiling, in the king's room, you'll see the ceiling covered with all these carved faces. One man, a local man from Livingston called John Donaldson, spent six years carving in all what we know as the copies. But up there are the original carvings from the 1500s, so two good reasons to go up there. Just the first room of the palace, just to give you the palace. And we do know it's the king's side of the palace because this I-5. Go through to the Queen's room, it becomes an I and an M. M for Mary Louise. Um, I, 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 I'll point at this. There's two things here. Anyone who's got the magic number thing, I see one or two of you have. Each room will have its numbers. And this will tell you what room you're in. As I say, the people in costumes are through here as well, doing little pieces, otherwise I'd take you through. Uh, I think for me what's really different between the king's side of the building and the queen's side is this. Furniture. James V, having died, had decided not to put any furniture in his room. <laughs> Written down in the inventories, the number of carpets, the number of stools. Some fragments of Mary of Guise's furniture do survive in museums, so we have things like that to work from. Please, if you do have any more questions about how we have tackled this, now's your opportunity. I'm just finishing the tour. I'd better mention one more thing. And actually, what's the gentleman who's got the guidebook that's yeah, out? Yeah. I will show, because it's a very small group, I'll, I'll actually show you a picture of it because it's, it's a beautiful, it's a remarkable townhouse that's just across the car park. It's called the Argyles Lodging. You can visit this free today with your castle ticket. Just show your castle ticket and get a free visit for that. It's just across the car park. I better mention that too. It closes at quarter past five, but again, you really want to be there for five o'clock to do it. It's just as you know. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna just, oh, sorry, I'm going to give that back to somebody else. Have a great day here. Thanks for coming and seeing us. Have a great holiday here in Scotland. You see my colleague Ryan here. Do you ask any of the questions you have? Thank you very much. Thank you.